Welcome to the uh, study abroad information session uh, for specifically designed for co uh, College of Art and Arts and Sciences. Now, one of the things uh, that uh, you, of course, already know since you are in the college that you do have quite a lot of different majors available within that pro uh, within that college. So it was quite interesting for me to try to put put this together because I can't just talk about global studies. I can't just talk about you know, pre-med, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, and those are obviously all very uh, varying kinds of different kinds of programs. Uh, it's not like doing one for business department where it's just business, you know, it's marketing, you know, entrepreneurship and then accounting is so somewhat related. But um, one thing uh, that I can tell you that is uh, very useful for everyone is the fact that study abroad will be very useful for everyone in any major and uh, so on. So, for example, so let's start with um, just the basics. Uh, the, this is how the session is going to go. We're going to do about 20, 30, 30 minutes of just uh, uh, general information about all the programs and uh, um, et cetera. And then I am uh, going to address the questions that you asked in the registration, uh, during the registration. And uh, we will also try to address any uh, questions that come up during the presentation as well as we go. So why study abroad? Well, um, don't know if you've thought about what it will be like after you graduate, but the first and the biggest regret uh, probably that a lot of people have is uh, just focusing on studying and studying and studying and studying so much to the, fact, to the point where they um, never really take the time to, to actually go on study abroad. Uh, I graduated a long time ago from college, and uh, I did do several uh, study abroad um, trips or, or semesters abroad while I was a student. Uh, and uh, when I talked about it to all my friends that I graduated with, they all, I mean, we're talking 100% of anybody that I talked to say, why didn't I do that while I was still a student? Because think about it. I mean, what, your life is right now uh, organized in terms that are nicely uh, separated out and put into little pieces of it, you know, 10 weeks at a time, that is almost uh, perfectly designed so that you can just take a break and go and do something else in Germany, in Singapore, in London, and things like that. And uh, it's a little bit harder to take 10 weeks off uh, on a vacation when you are working full-time as, um, as pretty much anything. Oh, goodness. Especially if you, let's say, you end up, if you're, let's say, pre-med and you end up in the med school or something like that, forget taking 10 weeks off and just going off to England for, you know, just... So take uh, advice from all the people that have gone before you and those that have not gone and wish that have gone, that that is something you will definitely want to consider. And then of course, uh, it is in a world of uh, ever shrinking world uh, of, glo of global, um, well, seems like the word global is in everything these days, isn't it? No matter what you're doing, it is something that you definitely want to be able to say that you have been outside of your own hometown, outside of your own state, and hopefully outside of your own country as well, to experience how other people live, to experience how other people have fun, to experience how other people think. I mean, in this world, in today's world, where everything is connected around the world and in the whole globe is just like one big country, feels like sometimes, it is very, very, very important. It is very hard to have an open mind and an expanded view of the world when you haven't really made friends with other people around the world. So I hope you will take that as, um, as, a, as that as well. And then here is another fun thing if you're wanting to think more practically about this, why this is useful for you no matter what major you are and no matter what field you're going into is that it does stand out. It does make your resume stand out. It does make you stand out among the crowd of people that are applying to this one company. They are always looking for something that differentiates you from other people. Only 10% of undergraduates go on study abroad and that makes you different when you go. That makes you stand out. That makes you unique. That makes you interesting. You know, it's a lot more interesting uh, to be able to say, yes, I spent a whole semester in Singapore and I learned, I got to make friends that were coming from all over the world to study abroad there. So definitely recommend uh, from all those different things. Talk to anybody who has gone on study abroad. I'm sure you have some friends who have. 
um, it is something that you will never forget. It is something that will literally change your life in ways that you never thought of. All right, it's just moving on to a couple of myths that I have to bust here, doing some myth busting that uh, always ends up happening because we all seem to have certain ideas about what study abroad does and how it works, but it is actually a lot of things are not true. For example, that it is only available for certain majors. Okay, if you're global studies, like I almost don't have to like sell it to you. I mean, you're global studies. You are interested in the globe, the world. Uh, you are interested in studying abroad, I hope. Uh, that's why you're global studies. But um, it's not just for people that are doing global studies or that are doing uh, you know, minors in Chinese or international business. It is also, uh, you can do this and it is also useful like we just talked about for any major. Uh, and it is open to all majors and all majors uh, should be able to make it work. And that is why we are here. People like Ashley and me who are here to try to help you to make sense of how this can work and how we can fit this into your program. And that leads into, if I go abroad, I will get behind and graduate late. That is once again, um, I would like to tell you is a myth. The, obviously, if you have a lot of electives in your room, that does make things a lot easier. So if you can save electives for your study abroad term, um, do it. You know, it's a lot, uh, it's probably a very good use of your elective hours. However, even if you don't, there are programs that are out there that can help you take classes that would actually go towards your major, which would help you not fall behind. And if it would actually, uh, you know, and then that's why we have all these different courses that other students have taken, all published on our website so that you can look, oh, it's like, hey, look, another bio major has gone on this program and actually took these courses and it actually transferred as this particular thing that I actually needed my major. This is why we also work individually with you. We work with you, your academic advisor works with you, your co-op advisor works with you through this whole process to make sure that this fits into your plan of study and that you're not go just going in blindly before you know, just go and then see what happens. That's not how it works. Ah, another myth is that you have to speak another language. You'll be surprised how many uh, study abroad programs do not require a foreign language um, as a, for example, like you could go to Denmark and you don't even have to speak Danish. You could go to Netherlands for a semester, for a term and not speak a word of Dutch, etc. Of course, there are some programs that require you to actually speak Spanish require you to be fluent in German, but those are specifically designed for those people that are looking for the language immersion. I'm talking about your modern languages. Oh. And uh, so if you uh, are actually looking for that, that's perfectly fine, but you don't have to be trilingual to be able to go on one of these programs. There are plenty of programs in places like Australia, uh, in England, in uh, Singapore speaks English, Hong Kong speaks English etc, etc. We will talk more about those as well. And this is a question that a lot of people have also asked. It's just cost too much. Well, you'll be happy to know that uh, if you are attending Drexel, that means you can study abroad, most likely. Meaning, whatever you're paying to Drexel, tuition, whatever scholarships you're getting to go to Drexel, you can use that to study abroad. And um, most of the time, the extra costs uh, would be something like um, well, housing, you already pay uh, on beyond tuition. So in some countries, that'll actually be cheaper than Philadelphia. Believe me, Philadelphia is not the cheapest city in the world. Uh, and also, um, well, flights, but we also have scholarships for that kind of things. Now, moving on to the elephant in the room. I think that's an elephant in New Jersey or something like that, if I remember. Some of you are nodding. It's like, I think you know what that is. All right, so let's uh, address the elephant in the room, uh, COVID-19. Summer and spring programs have canceled. Uh, if you haven't heard, uh, that is something that has happened already. Fall programs are technically still running. We don't know if it will cancel or happen. Um, that's something that the uh, administration of Drexel is working on figuring out just uh, and they just have to figure something uh, out as far as 
weigh the options of what is available, what countries are open, uh, you know, and things like that. And most important of all, will our students be safe if they go to this country? Winter 2021, there's not even really much of a talk about that. We're just all assuming, oh yeah, that should be perfectly fine. I mean, by then, by then, uh, fingers crossed, hopefully things will have calmed down. Uh, it's gotta, right? Hopefully, we'll keep it. And all the bio majors in here are like, oh, you don't know much about COVID-19, do you? Well, <laughs> hopefully you can tell me about it a little bit more. And we're hoping that uh, the world governments will get a handle on it, hopefully soon. But since it does um, entail certain uncertainty in the process, uh, Office of Global Engagement is providing a lot of more flexibility with things like withdrawals, refunds, transfers, deferrals, et cetera, et cetera, so that you, we can, so that you can try to sign up for this without thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna lose my entire deposit the moment I sign up or something like that. I mean, we're, we're trying to be very flexible with this kind of thing. I, I think all, pretty much everybody is. And like I said, we're closely monitoring the situation. You've probably heard that in a lot of emails and um, safety, your safety is our biggest priority. All right, let me do a quick thing about all the different program types we have. You will notice there are three different types. The first one is freestanding. Now, what's a freestanding? Uh, usually, it's a freestanding program that has been put together specifically to, for international students from around the world, and that includes American students going to, let's say, uh, France. So oftentimes, these programs are usually does not include a lot of local students. Uh, so let's say you are in London, but you are there with a bunch of American students, bunch of students from Korea, bunch of students from Russia, bunch of students from Germany. And they're all there to do a study abroad in a giant group together. Uh, so you often, you, you'll have a lot of other American students from other parts of the United States. These types of freestanding uh, courses they will actually uh, come back as Drexel credits and with actual letter grades. So it actually affects your GPA. Uh, so you can actually bring up your GPA during this time. Uh, usually it has a limited list of courses that you choose from, you know, because they're you also oftentimes very specific like uh, to certain topics uh, related to what you are doing. And um, just uh, and there's uh, usually a program fee involved with it that often, uh, most often is for the purposes of covering housing, some visa fees and other administrative fees and things like that. So yes, it's an extra fee, but it ends up being pretty much what you would pay on top of tuition just for housing and travel and things like that anyway. And then the other kind is a straight up exchange program which um, is probably the most traditional version of exchange program where you, we literally send a student or two or three or four, how many ever, to a particular university overseas and they send us their students to us and we do an even exchange of students. Uh, this is uh, what you would normally consider like study abroad, right? So you are in Prague taking classes in a normal classroom with a Czech professor from Czech Republic and students from there or something like that. So you are taking normal classes at a host university, obviously gives you a lot more choices in classes. Uh, so it is very desirable for people that are looking for particular courses within the entire university that they can do. Uh, so these usually come back as uh, credit, no credit, or pass fail, or pass, no pass, whichever what language you, lose, you use. Uh, and you have been, if you are in class spring and uh, somewhere right now at Drexel, you are getting used to this uh, idea probably. Now, one thing that I heard that uh, is a little bit different is that uh, in a study abroad program, you have to get a minimum of C to pass, whereas I think I heard that D is a passing grade. I don't know, don't quote me on that. Uh, talk to your academic advisor about that. Now, this kind of exchange program does not have uh, any kind of extra program fee. You pay for your own way to get there on a um, plane ticket, but you don't pay like, a program fee for your housing or something that is done directly with the host university and as i mentioned before compared to philadelphia most other university housing is a lot cheaper around the world maybe unless you are in london or australia those are pretty pricey places we'll talk about cost a little bit more when we talk about scholarships now a third uh, version is called intensive courses abroad 
these are usually very specific topics, a very particular course usually, that has a component of uh, during, uh, direct, um, during a, some, a term break, you go for like a week or 10 days to a particular uh, place that is related to that. Uh, a common, uh, like for example, I've heard of ICAs that are taking fashion students to a fashion show in Europe or uh, students that are doing environmental science that go to like um, green, uh, Iceland, you know. And they're usually uh, built around a very particular trip and particular um, topic, usually led by Drexel professors. Program fees usually cover like housing and the, the trip itself, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a good way to like take a course for like three credits uh, and you actually end up going on a trip and then you come back and it goes towards that term, like fall term or winter term, et cetera. So those are the three types of um, programs that we have and we can talk more about it later on when, later on. So when is a good time to study? Uh, I recommend generally earlier the better, like sophomore year or pre-junior year, mostly because you still have a lot of flexibility within your program. Uh, in your senior year, it gets a little bit trickier, right? Because you're trying to graduate and you're like, I absolutely have to take this one particular course to graduate. So if I can't take it in London, then I cannot graduate. This is why we need to meet with you, discuss your course of study, your plan of study and all of that uh, to make sure that kind of, you don't uh, end up putting yourself in a corner. And that's also why I recommend generally sophomore, junior, pre-junior is usually a good time. Fall programs work best uh, because it just gives you a lot more uh, flexibility with uh, the number of course, the number of school programs available, which uh, because uh, some fall terms on other schools are usually September to December, which fits a little bit better with our terms. Uh, whereas Drexel's winter term or spring term doesn't always fit neatly into other schools' spring semester. That's why fall and summer usually have most options, as well as a more uh, easily uh, workable schedule. But spring is of course still not out of the question, but this is also why we recommend talk with us to your academic advisor and a study abroad advisor so that we can work with you to uh, find the right one for your program, for your interests, for your um, uh, particular situation. And that is something that I will say over and over is that there are programs out there that work pretty much for every situation, hopefully, 90% um, of the time, I would say. And uh, even if you feel like, oh, my situation might be a little too tricky, talk to us, you might be surprised. And that's why we try to individually work with every student to figure out what works best and how it would work for your situation. The cost part. Like I mentioned earlier, while you are on study abroad, as far as cost is concerned, you, uh, you know, tuition and scholarships are concerned, it's as if you're still at Drexel. You are, it's like you are a Drexel student that just went to a different campus in Paris, something like that. So um, you pay regular Drexel tuition. That also means you get to keep all financial aid Excuse me. And uh, there are some program fees for freestanding and ICA programs, but like I mentioned, that usually ends up covering your um, living and like your, your housing and some of your transportation and things like that. It's a little different for each program, so we can talk about it, but usually it's like whatever you would have paid to stay in Philadelphia for the 10 weeks or three months or whatever is probably what you're going to close to what you would pay for program fee to be over there. There are also work study positions available while on study abroad, which is, yeah. And there are plenty of scholarships available. I will talk about some of those. Uh, Dragons Abroad scholarships, even scholarships for ICA. Uh, these go anywhere between $500, $1,200. Um, some of them are even $25,000. Uh, now, that's a really big one, obviously, a lot more competitive. Talk about it a little bit more as well. But the point is, we do have scholarships available that you can apply for to try to cover your flight. Maybe it'll help with your living expenses while you're over there. 
And like I mentioned before, there are some places where the living expenses are so much lower that you might, some, some people actually end up saving money by going on study abroad, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about. So if you have scholarships and you're like, oh, if I go on study abroad, I'd lose it. Don't worry, you'd still keep your federal aid. You'd still keep your financial aid, any scholarships you have. If you're a Liberty Scholar, by all means, et cetera. And all the other scholarships uh, that are available through Drexel, uh, they will still treat you as a full-time Drexel student. You get all the same funding. That's how it goes. Now, this is probably the slide that a lot of people have been waiting for. Um, but like I said, since there's so many different kinds of majors, it, is, it was kind of hard for me to find everything that keeps, that works for everyone. Uh, and that's the thing is that all the programs work for certain people. And so uh, talk to us we can help you figure it out because it's probably there, something that can work for you. Now, uh, like I said, if you're global studies, uh, that means the location is what's more important, like the area you're interested in. So we can talk about different areas. This is not all the programs. These are specifically the ones I thought that might be interesting to you. Now, modern languages, uh, these are the languages we have available. You can take intensive Chinese, intensive Korean, uh, Spanish, French, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, to, that goes towards your certificate or your minor, if you're still a minor in, let's say, Korean minor or something. Uh, there are, for example, uh, the, the one I've heard about a lot is that if you're in any kind of healthcare related major, that it's really hard. Uh, for, I, so I would like to highlight two programs, uh, Drexel in Costa Rica, which is about uh, I think Ashley can actually tell you a little bit more about it uh, if, if she is interested in, um, if, if you are interested in, in that as well. Um, and uh, so, so that's, you know, it's healthcare in Latin America. And this is actually open and specifically designed. The classes you take while on this program are specifically for those in healthcare, pre-med, nursing, et cetera. Uh, and you get to learn what how that's done in Costa Rica. You get to learn, you know, some Spanish while you're at it. And I think if you are going into a kind of healthcare profession, you do realize that even in the U.S., it's not a bad thing to know Spanish while you're in the healthcare uh, profession. So to understand that, I think it'll be really useful for you as well. Or you can uh, take a Traxel in England, you know, healthcare in London program. Also similar to that as well, but in London. Uh, I've also heard people say something about, oh, is it hard to do this if you're a bio major? And because you have so much already that you have to do while you are here. And once again, this is why uh, we, and, and yes, bio majors can go study abroad. That is actually something that I probably should as myth number five or something. Uh, it is actually possible, even if you're pre-med, if, you, if you're bio. Obviously, like I mentioned before, it's a lot easier if you're, let's say, at least pre-junior, uh, even a junior. Senior year, uh, it'd be a little bit harder for bio majors, I think. Uh, but once again, it just depends on how good were you with, let's say, saving electives, how many ever you have. And I've, uh, those are just a few of the universities that other students have gone before uh, as bio majors and have transferred bi um, biology classes or any kind of like sciences types of classes that you had to have uh, for your major actually. And then on the right side of the column, I figured I can list a uh, list out a list of list out a list uh, list universities that are highly ranked universities. We're talking um, the little number thing I have in the parentheses next to them. That's the world ranking. These are just some of the universities that are within the 100 top universities in the world uh, that we partner with so that you can go and study at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, ranked 11th in the world this year. That's above, that's above pretty much almost all US universities, I think, um, with the exception of like Harvard and Yale. Uh, and then, um, and these are also, the reason I list them out is, this is good for ma all majors, but if you're in the sciences, uh, if, you're, if you need to take high level bio classes, chemistry classes, and other sciences, there are programs that are specifically designed for that unless you're like, let's say like healthcare, right? But that also doesn't mean you can't go and study abroad because we have university-wide agreements, which means we have an agreement with their biology department, their chemistry department. Those are the two that I keep bringing up, but all other sciences as well. If they have it in their catalog and they didn't, and then 
you should be able to do it unless for some reason they limit it. But very few do, unless it's some kind of a very, um, you know. But uh, so these university-wide exchange agreements, you know, are good for all majors, but uh, if you are a science major thinking, oh, I can't go and study abroad, I don't see any university, any program that says science this, you know, whatever, or chemistry program at Aarhus in Denmark or something. And it's because we have a university-wide agreement. So you should be able to take all those classes. And, uh, and if you have a chance to take a class at literally world leading, one of the highest ranked universities in the world, hey, why not? I mean, I don't know if you have a lot of interest in research. Uh, some do, some don't, but hey, this might be a good option. So some just examples of other programs that students have gone from COAS. Um, once again, these are just not exhaustive lists. Uh, there's a lot that is on our website. So please feel free to go on, the, on our website, which is drexel.edu study abroad. Uh, and you can actually search by discipline. Uh, that you are interested in and that'll help you narrow it down. And of course, we're always there to help you with that. And uh, so I think I'll just go ahead and skip these. Uh, this is an interesting list as well. Like I mentioned, there are a lot of universities with no language requirements at all that you can go and study. So if you don't have room in your program, in, in your plan of study for that extra language course, you can still go and study abroad without worrying about that. Hey, Youngman, we have a question in the chat box. Sure. Um, so it says, for the university agreement universities, um, are all of those colleges in English slash have the ability to be taught in English? Almost all programs that we have uh, as exchange partners, will classes will be in English, yes. There are only two or three or maybe four uh, partners that we have that teach uh, in the native language and those you will no notice uh, because they will usually have a very high language requirement like they will have Spanish 3.0 something requirement or uh, German 300 level requirement to study almost like almost all of the rest of them will be taught in English yes thank you for that thanks young man if anyone else has any questions, again, feel free to put them in the chat box and I will be able to see them. Thanks. So, uh, and uh, quickly to go over some of the ICAs, uh, as I mentioned, as you, can t as you can tell, these are very specific topics that uh, a particular intensive course abroad covers. So um, once again, if you are interested in a particular area, this is actually, and, and also don't have time for an entire full term program, this is actually a really good way to, to do it. Uh, I've, we've had people do like three, four of these in the course of five years there here at Drexel. So for example, uh, you know, green energy in, intensive in Iceland or I don't know, crime in Scandinavia, I don't know, a culture and community in Dominican Republic, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Legacies of Nazi era policing. Okay, I hadn't noticed that one before. That sounds really interesting. Uh, but browse them. There's so many of those. Uh, this is just a, just a few examples of ICAs, past ICAs. And the way the ICAs work is like you um, work with the professor that is putting it together, he or she, will um, kind of interview you and you sign up for the class and there's a lot of coursework that's done before and after and then you go before or after. Now, what if you don't have, see, yes, go ahead. You, sorry, do you mind if I jump in? We have another question about ICAs. Um, the question is, well, we have a couple that just came through, so give me one second. Mm -hmm. The first one is, are the LeBeau International Residency ICAs for the international consulting class? That's a very good question. I would have to, have, I would actually have to go into the actual syllabus uh, or the course description to see that. Uh, if you Google that uh, or search for it on our website, you sh it should give you a lot more specific information. That one, I don't have an immediate answer. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not sure about that one either. No, that's okay. Um, the next question we have is, can we find more ICA options on the Drexel website? Definitely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, if you go to our website and you go to the under the programs tab, You'll be able to search it under there. Um, and then the last question that we had come in is, do ICAs count toward electives? 
So it depends on which ICA you pick. If an, uh, so it all depends on which uh, department code and course code you get with that particular ICA. Uh, so let's say if a professor in COAS is doing an ICA about a particular topic and let's say it's about and it's from the global studies, for example, then it would actually count towards global studies credit. Uh, so it's just like any course you are signing up for at Drexel where you have to watch exactly how it is categorized and if it fits the particular requirements. So ICAs are very highly individualized, highly specific courses. Uh, that's why it just depends on which course you pick, uh, just like if you were doing any course uh, selection at Drexel. Thank you. We've got one more. Yep. Um, about ICA. So if you take an ICA, is it applied as a credit for a particular quarter? Essentially, if you take an ICA, can you mm. still take 20 credits the next quarter without an extra charge per credit? Yes, it is very specific to which quarter it applies to. So for example, if it's a fall break ICA, then it goes to the fall term, I believe, right? Yes, <laughs> I, at least I'm trying to remember which way it goes. But And unfortunately, uh, I know it'd be so convenient if we could just move it around whichever way, but the way the uh, uh, university um, ac uh, academic credit system works is that it has to be registered as a particular term. So each ICA will have a particular term it is associated with, even though it's happening in the break time. Uh, and that's the term it will show up on your transcript and it is not something we can move around within it. Anyone else have any other questions before we move on? Feel free to throw them in the chat box. All right, I think we're good. Okay, Go ahead, so Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you. And so independent study abroad now is this is for highly adventurous people who just went through every possible program that we have to offer and realized there is nothing that Drexel study abroad offers that is actually something I want to do. But I heard about this one other university that I can come as a guest student or visiting student, but it's technically not on our sponsored by Drexel list, which just means that we don't have an official uh, partnership agreement with them. And so there's no, no uh, automatic like, transfer of things and whatnot. What that means is that you can actually still go uh, and work with us to sign up for an independent study abroad so that we can work with uh, so so you're working through the uh, study abroad office, education abroad office to make sure that Drexel is aware that you're doing this and to help you through the transfer process and everything like that. But if you do this, you know, the pro is that you can go anywhere. You can pick any university that, will, that is willing to take any program that's willing to take you. But it is going to come back as a transfer credit, uh, not specifically Drexel credit. Now, that usually is not big of a problem because even colleges that, uh, in departments that don't normally take transfer credit will often make an exception, usually make an exception for independent study abroad because it is technically still going through us except you are finding your own program. But however, Drexel financial aid, Drexel scholarships might not apply. So if you're paying out of pocket anyway, because if you don't have any scholarships, then this is actually not a bad thing because you're not losing scholarships by doing this. Uh, and because you're not paying Drexel for that term, you're paying that university wherever you're going in, um, I don't know, Stockholm uh, yourself out of your own pocket. So that's something you can uh, consider if you're like, I really want to go here, but, you know, uh, but Switzerland or something. But Drexel doesn't have a program in Switzerland, for example. This is the big scholarship. Um, like I mentioned, there are other smaller scholarships that can help you with, let's say, a plane ticket, uh, you know, or uh, living expenses and things like that, uh, like diversity scholarship, financial needs scholarship that we do uh, internally. But this is, uh, for example, a St. Andrews Society of Philadelphia scholarship, McNeil scholarship, goes up to $25,000 where you spend almost a full year, September through May, a full academic year in, in most other universities at, in Aberdeen in Scotland. Uh, it is one of the four ancients, which is like uh, pretty much the Ivy League of um, Scotland in a way of speaking. And, um, you know, it's, uh, we, we have a guaranteed, one guaranteed for Drexel student every year. So we get to send one lucky student, has to be a citizen and 3.25 GPA minimum, um, and you apply, there's an essay, right, and there's a whole committee that reads them and decides them, and and you get to be the lucky one that's literally getting paid to go to and spend a year in uh, Aberdeen. There are other scholarships uh, that, for example, uh, the State Department, uh, like the US government does, to encourage students to go and study abroad, also gives them several thousand dollars to 
um, to go abroad and study abroad because even the U.S. government realizes this is a very, very good way for our, our students, you know, for our future leaders. And so uh, it is something that I highly recommend that you speak to us about if you're thinking about Aberdeen, for example, or any other university, uh, any other study of our program. Uh, like I said, we have a lot of information about that. And uh, the fellowships office of Drexel, for example, will actually work with you on uh, grant applications for like things like um, the State Department uh, scholarship, for example. Uh, Gilman, for example, is the name of it. There's some that are specifically so that you can go study abroad in Asia and they'll pay you several thousand dollars to go do that and things like that. So there's a lot of different ways and uh, surprisingly a lot of ways that a lot of people don't think about or even don't take advantage of. Did I see some more questions coming up? Yep, you did. Um, we've got two that just came through. Um, the first one is, is it too late to apply for fall 2020 or winter 2021? Fall 2020, yes. Uh, and I mentioned uh, we are still up in the air about whether it will run for fall 2020. Um, so, but winter 2021 and on are all already open. Uh, I will talk more about deadlines later, but you are actually, this is the time to apply for winter programs and on. Thank you. And we've got one more that just came through. Um, what if we are an incoming freshman interested in studying abroad in the spring? in the spring. Oh, so you, the, somebody who started in fall 2020. Okay. I think they're an incoming meeting. They'll be starting this upcoming year. Oh, oh, really? Do we, I didn't realize we had incoming students in this session. So um, the, actually there are freshman friendly ICAs available. Uh, not a lot of programs are available as a full-term program for freshmen in the spring, uh, mostly because a lot of universities will actually have a requirement that you have studied a one full academic year at a host university before coming as, a, as an exchange student, or sometimes they have ones that are just for one semester, and so spring can possibly be available, but uh, those are very few and far between. So generally, summer of your uh, freshman, between your freshman and sophomore year, is usually about the earliest that we start. But then there are, like I mentioned, some freshman-friendly ICAs that are also available. That's a really good place to kind of dip your toe in and start as a freshman. And then fall of sophomore year, you're spending your whole semester, whole term in Singapore or something and things like that. Great, thank you. And we've got one more that just came through as well. Um, it says, when, when are the deadlines for winter 2020, 2021? That's a mouthful. <laughs> ICA. Th so this upcoming December. Um, and yeah. have any of them been canceled and are rearranged as yeah. in time, so, time wise? Uh, some fall programs have been canceled by, our, by the partner universities. But most of the fall is technically still running as far as we know. But more, more on that will probably follow once Drexel makes a full official decision about how fall is going to look like. I'm sure we're all waiting on that, uh, you and I, all of us. Um, winter 2021, <laughs> the winter term uh, deadline is August 1st. And we will uh, show you a little bit more about deadlines in the upcoming well, Hey, guess what? <laughs> deadlines. <laughs> so yes. Winter, uh, fall is usually February 15th, winter is August 1st, spring is September 1st. These are application deadlines. Summer programs, actually, this is actually a good time if you're actually trying to think ahead, a whole year ahead. Uh, right now is a good time because we have priority deadline, which kind of helps you to know by October 15th or some, uh, by November to know, oh, I already am accepted into the summer whatever program. You can do that right now. ICAs are a little bit different. Um, individual programs have different schedules. So you'll want to check uh, first, identify which ICA might be interesting for you and then talk with us or the professor. Okay. There was um, one extra question that came through. Um, it was mm -hmm. kind of a follow-up to the, the last one, mm -hmm. um, which I think you just answered actually. Um, is August the deadline for uh, winter, this upcoming winter's ICAs as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. For this upcoming winter, you will want to apply by August 1st. For the ICAs, though? That, those are, uh, those are no. very, right? With, with ICAs, it's different. And uh, a lot of the fall ICAs have canceled. I think professors have just pretty much preemptively said, ah, I don't want to mess with it right now. Um, but winter ICAs are still being um, run by professors. So a lot of professors are expecting winter probably to run as normal. 
So uh, that is individual different for every ICA. So we'll, we can do that. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, so the uh, questions that, these are some of the questions and I try to group them together that you asked while, when you registered, I asked you to ask me a question. And uh, a lot of questions had to do with co-op cycles. And this is actually a really good question uh, because want something you, uh, yes, you can fit it into, a, let's say, 5-3 co-op schedule. Um, and uh, what often happens is that, like I mentioned, like uh, fall is a very popular time, but what, what do you do if you're on a fall-winter co-op? Little known fact, you can actually switch your co-op schedule, co-op cycle. Uh, and the, the reasoning of, I want to go on this study abroad in the fall of 2021. They don't offer this program in the spring. Can I switch? This is one of the few legitimate reasons uh, where Steinbright will actually allow you to change your co-op. Uh, they will wait until you're accepted into the program, of course, so that you're not abusing it, uh, just to change things whenever you want, because uh, they don't want to encourage that kind of thing. Now, something that a lot of people have get a little bit confused sometimes is that it does study abroad like replace co-op, and, and even if you are, let's say, a global studies major, no, it does not replace a co-op uh, that is still something separate. However, we highly recommend international co-ops, which you can arrange uh, with, uh, with Steinbright as well. So those are some co-op related things. And then uh, plan of study related uh, questions were, uh, the takeaway is we will work with you. You will want to, we will actually ask you and you will want to work closely with your academic advisor uh, to make sure that your plan of study, uh, you know, this study abroad fits into the plan of study and it can because the courses you take in other countries can transfer uh, into actually your major. Uh, but of course that, that authority rests on the department heads and that's why we have an entire pre-approval process that we work with you to go through uh, so that you can uh, get a particular courses you're planning on taking let's say in uh, Rome pre-approved so that you know exactly what uh, kind of course how that will transfer into your major for example so you know all of this before you go uh, so as long as you pass those courses and since it comes back as uh, Pass and fa pass fail in exchange programs, so uh, or letter grade if it's freestanding. So and then um, a lot of people had questions about COVID nineteen. Um, does this change how things work? Well, yes. Uh, the whole world is probably going to be a little bit different from now on in how the world is. You know, we will all be very careful. We'll probably all become germaphobes. That's pretty much it. Uh, and so. But uh, even before this, we already had uh, on-call is an emergency service. Uh, for example, when, um, when the protests were happening in Hong Kong a while ago, we were able to literally bring all of our students, literally like one of those movie scenes where you just take them out, maybe not quite as dramatic as in movies, but still, we were able to actually use these services to bring out our students, bring them home or to their home country so that they were not embroiled in all the political unrest that was happening. So, but everything else, uh, just study abroad, education abroad, education in general will continue in certain, with a little bit of different flair perhaps, uh, and with all the normal precautions. And uh, there were some questions about scholarships. I hope I answered them before during the presentation. It can help with your travel cost or tuition, uh, depending on how much scholarships you already have. And uh, there are a lot of scholarships available, like I mentioned. And like I said, if you're already getting scholarships or federal aid, uh, financial aid of any kind, that applies to you as you are studying abroad. And uh, the really hard question for many seniors is, can this actually be possible? Yes, technically it is possible. Um, like I mentioned, it's a lot easier if you're a sophomore just because you have a lot more electives still left over. But it, once again, it just depends on each individual's particular situation. And I am happy to, we are all happy to work with you to see how we can make it work. And I can't promise you anything, but I can also promise that we will do our best. And I'm sure a lot of times it's actually possible. Questions? Yep, we've got two that just came through uh, on this slide. 
Um, one is, I am from Sierra Leone and Drexel doesn't have a partnership with any university from there. How can I make Drexel have a partnership with universities there? That's very interesting. Uh, so the partnerships, yeah, pretty much two universities meet and say, hey, we have a lot of students that want to study there. And they say, well, we have a lot of students that want to study at, at your, in Philadelphia. And so uh, they meet and uh, sign MOUs, a Memorandum of Understanding, and eventually an official partnership. This is usually a like, two-year process, uh, so it just depends, a year or two process, uh, so it just depends on every school. But uh, we're constantly working on uh, finding new partnerships and uh, new agreements. And so perhaps Sierra Leone might be there someday as well. The next question is, uh, do I have to resubmit my application? I submitted mine before to go during this summer term. Ah, okay. Um, some elements of the application you will want to redo. Um, for example, maybe you'll want an updated essay because you're going to a different program. But if not, maybe you can just kind of edit the old one and reuse it. I don't know if that counts as self-plagiarism. I'll leave that up to you. Um, and um, the references, if you feel like those are still very good references, that's perfectly fine. But if you feel like since then you've gotten better uh, references, please feel free to update those. Uh, things like certain forms where we make you uh, meet with an academic advisor and get their signature might have to be redone. So it just depends. Some items will have to be redone. Some items can be reused. So usually when you meet with your advisor, they can literally move most elements of your old application into the new application. Thank you. And then there's one more that just came through. Um, do all of these programs run for a full term or do the lengths differ? Lengths differ. Depends. For example, there are some summer programs that only run for four weeks. They're really intensive. Uh, so you end up having a little bit of time in between to explore the surrounding areas. For example, students that do Hanyang in South Korea summer program are only there for July. So they spend June and August just traveling Hong Kong, Singapore, Philippines, Japan, China, etc. Um, there are uh, some programs that run 10 to 12 weeks, so you end up using all of your break plus the entire term. There are some programs that run like 15 weeks, so you end up having to cut your co-op short to be able to go on those programs. So it just depends on the program uh, you are signing up for. Every university has their own calendar, and oftentimes we're just trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, and that's why we have several uh, education ab abroad advisors whose full-time job literally is to help you figure these things out. That's what we do. All right, thank you. I th that's all we have right now. Okay. Um, I think that pretty much uh, covers almost all the uh, areas. If you can't, uh, if, if there are some things that you forgot to ask or some things that I didn't cover that you're like, I really would like to know that later on, please feel free to contact us through any of these means. Uh, if and when we are back on campus, academic building is where we will be. Right now, I'm in my own home, as you can tell, like everybody else. Um, so before I close, um, Marissa Olson, who is one of our student ambassadors, who has gone on our programs before, she's a global studies major, uh, she's in the same college, if Marissa is still on here, are you still on here? I don't have my list. Yep, she is. Okay. Would you mind saying a couple of words of what you normally tell people when they ask, tell us about your study abroad experience. Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, I mean, in general, you're here. So that's a good sign that you're interested in studying abroad. I know for me, um, my international experiences really shaped me as a student. Um, and have been some of the biggest parts of my college experience. So like I was saying earlier, I have done an intensive course abroad, which kind of give it, has given me this interest in the world. And I actually changed my major to global studies after that. So that was uh, kind of cool. Um, but the program in Costa Rica, I actually live with a host family. And if you ever have a chance to live with a host family, I think you should do it. That's just my opinion. Um, I still talk to my host mom. Um, I was in, immersed into the Costa Rican, Costa Rican culture, as well as I was kind of forced to speak Spanish every day because my host family spoke only Spanish. So that was also an interesting experience and a learning experience, but it helped um, help me with my language skills. And I guess like touching on other things with co-op interviews and um, future 
career options. Like maybe you want to work in another country after going abroad and you'll have networking and connections in these other places. And that's like a really great thing that not all students have. So I definitely think that you should study abroad. Um, if it's hard to do for a whole term, look into the intensive courses abroad. They are still super uh, rich experiences, even though they are shorter. Um, yeah. And if you have any questions specifically for me too, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Marissa. And thank you, Ashley.